Moin Moin und herzlich willkommen. Hello and welcome to History and Politics, the Körber Stiftungs Podcast that deals with the question of how and why history shapes the present. My name is Florian Bigge and I would like to warmly welcome Katja Heuer and Oliver Moody who are hosting our special podcast series on the new Germany. It's episode number four and I'm honored to welcome Brandon Sims as our special guest, director of the Center for Geopolitics at Cambridge University. But now, enough talking on my part, over to you, Katja and Oliver. Strategic thinking is something that does not come naturally to younger German foreign policymakers. In fact, it is completely alien to us. For three decades, we have been cocooned away from the harsh world of power politics. The exceptional world that we grew up in was our normal. The ideas that developed out of 1989 were our convictions. Now that geopolitics, and specifically geopolitical power politics, is back, we are lost. We have intellectually and practically disarmed. As we never had to train our strategic muscle, it atrophied. Power politics is at odds with our understanding of how the world works. We don't have our brains wired in this way. We don't speak the language and are thus utterly unprepared to face opponents with different interests who are increasingly vocal in questioning what we thought was ultimately the only system. How did this happen? Those are the words of Ulrike Franke, a German foreign and defense policy analyst at the European Council of Foreign Relations, in an essay published on the War on the Rocks blog a couple of years ago. But with the land war raging at the gates of Europe, The questions she raised seem all the more relevant today. Welcome back to The New Germany, a podcast series from the Kerber Stiftung's History and Politics program. In each episode so far, we've looked at a different aspect of Germany's way of doing things that has been challenged or even overturned by Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine. But today, we're going to look at the most fundamental question behind these issues – Does Germany have a plan? And if not, why not? For many years, thinkers have been complaining about the supposed death of German strategic culture. But at the same time, Germany has more strategies than a Californian pickup artist, covering everything from global health and sustainable finance to hotly anticipated position papers on China and national security. Thank you, Ketja, for that mental image of Olaf Scholz negging and love-bombing his way through international summits, which I am sure will not in any way haunt me to my deathbed. You're very welcome. I do my best. I'm Katja Hoyer, a German historian in Sussex. And I'm Oliver Moody, a British journalist in Berlin. Katja, as another German millennial, if I may call you that... I did cringe there a little bit, but if the category stretches from uh, Philip Amtor to Helena Fischer, I suppose there's room in there for me. Oh yeah, would that be at the um, Philip Amtor end of the spectrum or the Helena Fischer end of the spectrum? <laughs> I don't really know, to be honest. Where do you sit on the spectrum from Prince Harry to Harry Styles? I'm probably more of a Philip Amtor, to be honest. But uh, still, as a, as a German millennial... What kind of shape is your strategic muscle in? Would you, would you say it's atrophied? I had to look up the word atrophied in the dictionary before we started this episode. <laughs> 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 But I can now uh, claim that or Sorry. say pretty with, with certainty that it probably isn't. I mean, when, when I was younger, I was, uh, it, won't hear, you know, it won't surprise you to hear that I was in a sort of bubble of history and politics geeks at school and, and throughout university as well. And like this entire debate around strategic planning and, and kind of grand strategy only really came up when people were talking about the wars and, you know, troop movements and, and you know, sort of geeky discussions as to where should Hitler have stopped and, and that sort of thing. And the, the term, I would say, is very much associated with that kind of thing. So with sort of geeks talking, I don't know, about about the grand plans of, of Napoleon or, or Stalin or whatever during the, you know, big wars that shaped the last two centuries or so. So it, it really isn't a thing that is applied to sort of current affairs or foreign policy at, at the present, I would say. Yeah. In the um, the essay we, we, we were quoting from at the start of this episode, um, Ulrike Franke 
whose fault the word atrophied is, by the way, not mine, was describing how a fellow German millennial had told her that geopolitics just, and I quote, sounded so much like troop movements. And I think there is this notion that, that the term grand strategy might seem like something out of a, a sort of irrelevantly distant past or like something out of a you know sort of Age of Empires 2 or a computer game like that. So um, can you start by maybe demystifying the term a bit? What, what actually is grand strategy and, and my, why might a state want or, or even need to, to get involved in it? Yeah, I mean, in essence, it's quite a simple thing, really. What it boils down to is that you define what you actually want as a state or as a country. So you lay out your your national interests in order of priority, ideally. And this may not necessarily always be the same as your values. So you might decide, for example, that trading with China a lot isn't necessarily something that you might, you know, trumpet from the roofs about because it, it's not in line with the values that you want to promote as a state, but it might still be in your economic interest to do so. And then once you've done that, you start assessing the strengths and weaknesses of where you currently are, your own position. This can be militarily, it can be in terms of the economy, soft power and so on and so forth. Which alliances are you in? Which which friends have you got? And then you look at your opponent's side, same sort of thing. You assess their strengths and weaknesses, what's actually standing in the way between you and achieving your your objectives. And you come up with a plan as to how you go around these factors, take them into account in order to achieve your, your aims. So in effect, this isn't something particularly controversial. It's something that states have always done. Having having spoken a bit kind of dismissively and, and jokingly about Age of Empires 2, I have to say, I actually met an official from the German foreign ministry not very long ago. And one of the things that they do is turn up to Civilization VI competitions. Have you ever played Civil the Civilization games? This maybe reveals my age a little bit. My favourite of them was always Age of Mythology, because you could send like chimeras out and, and elephants and, and mystical creatures and phoenixes and stuff. But yeah, I suppose the, the actual uh, underlying idea was the same. It just had magical creatures in it. C- civilization is, is a bit more hardcore than that, in that you are kind of stewarding a society through from kind of, you know, flint arrowheads to stealth bombers and then to interstellar space travel. And the latest iteration of this, they have these very kind of popular tournaments that are streamed on YouTube. And this guy from the German foreign ministry goes on and provides live commentary where he compares it to these kind of historical events and strategic gambits as a way of trying to re-engage young German people with with the concepts of strategy. I just thought that was absolutely fascinating as a piece of kind of public diplomacy. And in that vein, at the at the risk of sounding kind of ruinously naive, Germany is, as has been said many times, a, a rich country surrounded by friends and protected by the most powerful military alliance in history with no obvious threats to its actual sovereign territory. So why would it need to get its hands dirty with with something like this? Well, first of all, you could argue that it's in that position because somebody has got their hands dirty and thought about these things. I mean, even, you know, the one of the alliances you spoke about, you know, looking at NATO, for example, that, that came out of an idea of, you know, grand strategy, effectively. The, your idea is that over, over there, there's a huge, powerful Soviet Union that's just managed to defeat the biggest war machine history has ever seen and it's there in Europe occupying half of it so what you do to counter that you set up your own alliance you assess your enemy's strengths and weaknesses as we just discussed and your own and you realize that actually the individual countries in Europe and Western Europe are on their knees from the from the second world war as well and need to perhaps work together and be backed by an even bigger power namely the US and you come up with that sort of thing so you know it's it's naive to think you know and i'm not i'm not saying that about your question but in general it's naive to think that the situation that we're in at the moment is a result of of luck or of coincidence or whatever it's it's a result of grand strategy that happened before there's a, a favorite german phrase that people use kind of the, the world isn't a a pony horse a, a kind of pony farm or a pony ranch you know it's not a nice place it is a place where lots of different power political players are out there. Everyone's trying to achieve their own national interests. And they're, of course, at odds with, with one another. So 
there is there are many risks at the moment to the position that Germany is in, be that Russia's ambitions in Europe, be that China's expansion, and of course the way that Germany has made itself slightly dependent on that, or the risk of the US kind of pulling out of Europe and losing that weight, you know, in, in the geopolitical weight that it has in the region. So there's all sorts of things that Germany should really have a think about. And I, th- I think maybe given that, that some of us are, are trying to relearn some of these concepts a bit, it might be helpful to to look at a couple of examples from history where people have assembled strategies and, and, and it has very obviously worked out and been necessary. Even if these were times when the world was a bit simpler than it is today, it, it certainly was was no more of a, a, a pony farm. So my, my contribution to this geopolitical show and tell would be a man called uh, Clemens Wenzel Nepomuk Lothar, Prince of Metternich Winneburg zu Beilstein, who was foreign minister. Oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> my best. And then Chancellor of Austria at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. In a lot of ways, Metternich's beliefs, his, his methods and the geopolitical environment around Austria were radically different from the present. Obviously, there had just been a continental scale war. He was very much a, a monarchical conservative and able to to crush his domestic opponents through all sorts of tools at his disposal that are sadly unavailable to Olaf Scholz today, such as censorship, shooting protesters and declaring war on Naples. But Austria was a fading status quo power with an embarrassed military in a very volatile geopolitical situation. And however you choose to judge Metternich in a moral sense... I think it's pretty indisputable that he did a technically good job of navigating his country through something that we might now call a kind of proto-multilateral order. And the way he did that was to draw up very clear strategic priorities, which were things like constraining Russia, owning the, the pesky libs at home in Austria, holding the country together against all these various centrifugal national movements threatening to pull it apart, containing Prussian influence in the other German states and binding France back into the European balance of power and glossing over a fair amount of complex history. I think you can say ultimately he did pretty much all of those things and kept the peace in Europe for about 30 years until the 1848 revolution, at at which point he found himself forced to resign and condemned to the worst of all imaginable fates in that he had to move to Britain and take a house on in Sussex. Now, um, you, you can totally ask questions about whether Metternich's achievements would have been possible if he'd had to deal with, with a network of alliances that were as rigid as NATO and the EU are today, or if he'd been held democratically accountable in any meaningful sense of the word. And he did at one point get challenged to a duel by Tsar Alexander of Russia, which is not a situation I can picture Olaf Scholz getting himself into. But the um, the central point here is that Metternich couldn't have done any of this without without a very strong strategic compass. So which German-speaking strategist have you chosen, Katja? I thought you'd never ask. Otto von Bismarck. You astound me. Uh, I like to stay reliably uh, predictable. <laughs> no, I haven't just chosen him gratuitously because of my own personal interests in his doings in the 19th century, but because he genuinely... I think is arguably one of the best known grand strategists and perhaps also one of the most admired and most loathed of them. I mean, he did have a huge task on his hand after he'd effectively brought about the unification of, of Germany. He'd created this huge contra- uh, like unit effectively in the middle of, of Europe that was suddenly you know, there and people had to deal with it and it, it co- completely threw the power balance of Europe out of Kyoto. And for that reason, people were obviously quite sceptical and quite hostile against it to start with. And he needed to convince everybody in Europe, including Britain and Russia, that it was a good idea to have a giant German state. And the only way to do that was to deal with the one state that would never be convinced that this is a good idea, and that's France. And so effectively, Bismarck's grand strategy, to some extent, consisted, at least initially, of sort of isolating France diplomatically, because he knew it was never going to come on side and at the same time reassures or Britain and Russia and Austria to some extent that Germany, this new Germany, wasn't going to be a threat to it. Um, and he managed this remarkably well. And even though you had increasing conflict uh, 
between the other European powers. Um, I mean, the Austro-Hungarian and, and Russian conflict is arguably the most urgent, um, where basically his, his allies, his friends were drifting apart from one another. He still managed with various different alliances, some of them secret, some of them open, um, to sort of stay friends with each of them, despite the fact that they were rapidly turning into enemies. And, you know, that is down to sitting down and, and working out a very specific strategy, dealing with each of your components, assess assessing their strengths and weaknesses, looking at your own, looking at the geopolitical position that Germany was in in Europe and, and that the other countries were in and trying to find a way of, of having all of that coexist in in a sort of tension that he managed incredibly well, in my opinion. And when he left, he left this really, really complicated network of alliances and this kind of grand strategy that nobody knew like how it worked apart from him he left that behind and he left it to people to deal with that neither had the I want to say intellectual capacity nor the sort of astuteness that he had to deal with that and, and this kind of idea that Germany was dropping the pilot you know as it was famously phrased by British cartoonists it's quite remarkable Europe was sort of looking on in angst what would Germany do as a, as a rudderless country without a grand strategy you know, in, in, in all the five years I've been living in Germany, I, I don't think I've seen too many German politicians or, or officials refer approvingly to, to Metternich or, or Bismarck. Well, those who do tend to live in journalistic exile, for example, in rural Sussex. Well, that is a fate worse than being lynched by rabid Austrian liberals. I think we can both agree. In fact, the um, the German foreign ministry is currently trying to exercise the ghost of Bismarck by um, removing his name and his portrait from the, the Bismarck room. But while some of his goals and techniques may not have been that dissimilar to those of his German counterparts today, this, this brand of unapologetic realpolitik feels a world away from modern Germany. And it's, it's very often said that German strategic thinking essentially withered on the vine after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the, the dissolution of the USSR. Do you think that's true? And and if it is true, why did it happen? I find it quite astonishing. I, I do think it is true to some extent. I think there was a feeling that things didn't have to be managed in the same kind of ruthless and, and cold and calculating way anymore as they did before. I mean, quite you know famously, the sort of framing of that moment in history as the end of history applied to Germany in particular. I think there was a sort of sense that you know, we're, we're all friends now in Europe. The two power blocks have dissolved. Germany is back together. Um, you've got NATO there, yes, but it's also already beginning to to think about sort of, you know, extending eastwards. Uh, later, the EU will do the same thing. You effectively end up with the entire European continent, which was so long seen as the source of the worst kind of conflict that humanity was capable of as part of one block. You know, they're all allies. So there was, I think, a sense that, things could just be managed by talking about them. If within your group of friends you've got a problem, you can talk to them about it. You don't have to have a grand strategy to deal with it in a in a sort of aggressive way, I suppose. And and from that angle, I do think people sat, up, sat back a little bit and decided that grand strategy was a thing of the past. Yeah, so as a foreigner living in Germany, the, the thing that stands out most to me is that, that that first principle of grand strategy you were talking about earlier, this, this definition and prioritization of your national interests, doesn't really happen in the public sphere. It, it's, it, it's very hard for German chancellors to come out and say, this is what we think would be good for Germany on the international stage. For, for reasons that are kind of historically quite understandable, instead they tend to, they tend to blur those national interests with 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 Europe, so it will kind of leave them implicit. But I, I do think that gets in the way of of having a kind of open, strategic culture. Um, it's also worth mentioning that there is a there's a school of thought to which I, I do not necessarily subscribe, but which is certainly there, especially in the kind of Anglo American world, that 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 modern Germany does in fact have a grand strategy. It's just not one you'd recognise from the American or the British model because it's not really there to maximise Germany's geopolitical power so much as its geoeconomic power. So it consists of things like a very kind of dominant form of imposition of a, a German-friendly framework within Europe while at the same time being very 
conflict averse outside Europe and and pursuing this kind of almost quasi Bismarckian Schalke politique, this this kind of swinging backwards and forwards and equidistance between the East and the West. I'd be interested to hear what you think about that take. Yeah, I think there's something to that. I mean, you know, not having a grand strategy doesn't mean that Germany doesn't have interests. um, And certainly it does have economic interests, which has become very apparent in the way that they've unraveled since the invasion of Ukraine. But I do think having interests and coming up with a kind of coherent strategy as to how these interests can be pursued in the long run are two different things. So, for example, it is, of course, in Germany's interest to get cheap energy, say, from Russia, but to think that through to the end and come up with the idea eventually that, you know, over sort of the course of several decades, is it really a good idea to tie your entire economy and capacity to make foreign policy to the fate of another country, especially one that isn't aligned with your own interests in lots of other ways, you know, could have come up with the point that these two are conflicting things and you have to come up with a strategy to manage that. So I think Germany does have interests and I think it knows what these interests are, but I'm not entirely convinced that there is a medium or even a long term plan as to how this, you know, these these interests can be managed in a sustainable way. And the next big challenge on that route would be China, I think, where kind of a similar route has been taken. People have kind of just blindly walked after Germany's economic interests without having a bigger plan around this. You know, how can this be managed into the distant future? Yeah, and and we we've talked about that a bit in our China episode, but but in terms of the the kind of broader sweep, um, if you if you piece together the various public pronouncements from from Schultz and his allies, like a very boring three thousand piece puzzle, I think it's it's possible to make a, a coherent if if you know kind of foggy picture of the Titan vendor and where it's going. Um, you've got obviously higher military spending, a European Union that, that that contains another five or six more countries, but but has a decision making mechanism that that's less kind of gunked up with vetoes on on big questions of foreign and economic policy. You've got Germany taking some kind of more activist leadership role, a Führungsrolle in Europe, but also with respect to the kind of non aligned global South. You've got, as you were kind of alluding to there, a gentle ambling diversification away from the various economic dependencies on China without any kind of dramatic rupture. And above all, you've got a government that is doing its darndest to prevent the world from breaking up into two geopolitically opposed rival blocs like it did during the Cold War. So do you think that all of that, if you put it together, adds up to a strategy catcher. Would would Metternich be sitting there stroking his, his neckerchief in approval? I think he is certainly be stroking the neckerchief for whether it's in approval or not. <laughs> I'm not entirely I'm not entirely convinced. I really don't see that these these things I mean, I got quite excited when, you know, the, the Titan vendor was announced and I thought, yes, finally Germany is going to take some responsibility, find out what it actually wants to be in the world and in Europe and what it wants to do with with the potential, you know, the power potential that it just has given its economic weight and and the positioning of it in Europe. But I'm just not convinced that all of the individual aspects that you just mentioned really work together as a whole. There's still so much internal wrangling about this and also just so much aversion still against the very idea of Germany having interests that it needs to pursue, you know, with a grand strategy. There's still kind of a a sense, I think, that this is this is a dirty thing that you mustn't do. You know, this is just Germany going back to pretending, you know, to be to be a world power, and we all know where that ends. Kind of kind of thinking. So I'm I'm not entirely convinced that you know the the kind of power making people in Germany have already sort of grouped together to a decide what they actually want to do and b even that they want to have a grand strategy in the first place. But maybe we should go and ask an expert about that to put that into a slightly more um, historical context to see where we are in the grand sweep of things. I think that sounds like a very good idea. Our guest today is Brendan Sims, Professor of the History of European International Relations at the University of Cambridge and Director of its Centre of Geopolitics. Brendan has written numerous books covering an extremely broad sweep of Europe's modern history, from the Battle of Waterloo to an unsparing assessment of Britain's role in the Bosnian War, 
At the heart of his writing is the idea that foreign policy has tended to be one of the most powerful drivers of European politics. He has also very often put Germany at the centre of the story. Brendan, welcome to the new Germany. Hello, thank you for having me. Let's start off kind of quite far back in German history, as I, as I like to do. Are there any central problems that have consistently preoccupied German strategists since the beginning of the modern era? And if so, are they still significant factors today? Yes, I think there are several issues or, or, or complexes which we can identify over time. Probably the one that is best known is, is Germany's central location, the so-called Mittellage, right at the heart of Europe which uh, certainly in, in the hundreds of years leading up to 1945 was a, was a preoccupation for first Prussian and then German strategists, um, and indeed remained the case uh, during the Bundesrepublik, uh, right down to the um, fall of the wall and the collapse of communism, because Germany was seen as being wedged uh, between East and West. It's probably less salient now because Germany is surrounded uh, on all sides uh, by geographically, now by friends. Uh, but I think it still plays a role ideologically and psychologically in the minds of German strategists. There are a couple of other central dimensions. Um, one of them would be, the second one would be access mm -hmm. to markets uh, and raw materials. In other words, uh, Germany's uh, difficulty being cut off uh, from uh, the world system, uh, cut off from markets. Um, this is something which uh, certainly greatly exercised uh, Imperial Germany, greatly exercised the Third Reich. And you can also see today uh, with the question of security of supply chains, the question of, of um, access routes and all of that is still there. Uh, and then thirdly, there will be the question of demography. Uh, historically, that's been an issue around the big outflow uh, of Germans through, through emigration to particularly uh, the British Empire, and most especially, of course, the United States, which was seen as a big strategic problem. And now more recently, it's a question around immigration and all the challenges that that brings. And the final complex I would identify would be, and it relates to the whole Mittellager question, uh, is this question of, of balancing or oscillating between East and West, the so-called Schalkelpolitik or swing politics, associated particularly with the Rapallo Treaty of 1922 between Weimar Germany and the Soviet Union. So it's the sense that Germany isn't quite rooted in either East or West uh, and is somehow wandering or, or, or hedging between them. So those are really the four areas that I would identify that ma have mattered over time and to a considerable extent uh, matter today. Since you um, wrote the book on European geopolitics since 1453, I'd like to ask what sort of record do you think the German-speaking world had as a, a nursery of grand strategy um, before Germany was, was unified in 1871? And if there are any particular strategic thinkers you would, you would pick out as, as exemplary or even people we might be able to learn from today? Well, I guess the person who, who most people would single out would be Karl von Clausewitz, of course, is one of the great... Um, uh, thinkers about war and the nature of war and, and the, the central importance of the political in war. And that is, of course, something that is still relevant today. I would also like to identify two other figures, which are perhaps a little more alarming, but I think historically were very successful within their own terms. One would be Frederick the Great, who turned Prussia from, you know, really a congery uh, or, or just a group of, of very widely scattered territories in the middle of the 18th century to something much more consolidated and dynamic uh, by the end of the 18th century. And um, Otto von Bismarck, of course, the minister president and then the first chancellor of United Germany, um, as somebody who, who united Germany um, and created a kind of a greater Prussia and very much achieved his own aims. And the reason why I'm, I'm happy to quote both of them, even though they're problematic in many respects, is because uh, they knew where, when to stop. This is something that, of course, uh, later, uh, particularly early, early 20th century German strategists, uh, this was something they didn't know what to do, didn't know how to do. Uh, both Frederick the Great and Bismarck quit while they were ahead. Uh, 
uh, they were able to to take their gains to bank them. And I think that's something very important in grant strategy. Um, as somebody who has been accused of being sort of mildly obsessed with Bismarck, um, I'm interested to hear. So you're saying that he sort of knew when to stop and, and he largely achieved his aims. Do you think that if his sort of grand strategy would have been perpetuated further into the into the 20th century, could it have preserved the peace in Europe long term? I, I, I think so. It did require somebody of his ability uh, to conduct it, of course, if the famous glass perlenspiel, the game of, of glass glass balloons, uh, one might say. I'm not sure exactly how it translated. Um, but this idea of, you know, keeping everything in, in equilibrium, of being one of uh, two in a world of three or one of three in a world of five, and his ability to keep Russia and France apart, which, of course, the later generation failed to do, had that been maintained uh, under his skilled hands, I mean, this may not be the, the mm. historiographical consensus now, but I think had had that been maintained, then I think many of the problems uh, would have been avoided. At any rate, I don't think it was specifically his fault um, that that was the, the, the dynamic. It was just the nature of the European uh, state system as a whole um, th that was particularly precarious. Uh, and, and violent. So uh, I, I think, yes, if, if uh, Bismarck had still been there in 1914, which is the counterfactual, then the First World War would, would not have happened uh, in the way that it did. Or if there had been a war, uh, Bismarck most likely would have ensured that Germany would not have been in the predicament it was. It would have had a better alliance system uh, and Germany would not have been surrounded by enemies uh, in the way that it was. I mean, that may now be a minority view, um, but that's that's what I think. Staying with that that crucial point about um, knowing when to stop, do you think that there are any lessons modern strategists can take from the Third Reich and its downfall beyond the sort of um, cautionary horror that that informs a lot of German thinking about geopolitics today? Well, of course, we hesitate to learn any lesson whatsoever from the Third Reich uh, beyond that of of the dangers of hubris and of, of, of a racially driven foreign policy and all the other many things uh, that um, were and are objectionable uh, in the approach of the Third Reich to international affairs. I think if one were to be constructive about it, there are two lessons, which not everybody I think would share. The first is that the failure of the Third Reich's foreign policy in many ways mirrored that also of imperial Germany and perhaps of other uh, centrally located entities, uh, which is the, the difficulty of operating um, and of, of pursuing uh, you know, world war or, or a, a life and death struggle when you're unplugged from the global system. So, so Hitler actually recognized this. It was part of his analysis of the failure of uh, imperial Germany and that he would compensate for the, the lack of global markets and of raw materials through the construction of an empire, a territorial empire, and not a maritime empire in the East. But that didn't work either for the reasons uh, that we're all familiar with. So I think trying to survive uh, when unplugged from the global system is still a very important lesson today. And I think it's one that, in particular, the People's Republic of China, which is looking at this historical experience and trying to learn lessons. It's, it's something that, that they are very concerned about in Beijing. The second lesson relates actually to the first one, um, and again, maybe an unpalatable one, but it, it's really uh, the futility, in my view, of opposing the international Western capitalist and democratic system that, uh, you know, you, you can carve out um, uh, certain areas of, of, of autonomy, but if you actually fundamentally set yourself against the Western system in an aggressive way, then uh, you're likely to come to a sticky end. Um, and again, I, I think that's a lesson that should be taken uh, to heart in both uh, Moscow uh, and Beijing. And moving on to the post-war era, I think one of the themes that you mentioned earlier is, is sort of being picked up again by, by the West German state that is set up in 1949, namely this sort of oscillating between West and, and East. 
so you had under Konrad Adenauer, the first West German chancellor, a sort of drive towards integrating Germany into the Western system under his so-called Westbindung policy. And then later on, under the first social democratic chancellors, uh, particularly Willy Brandt, you get the so-called Ostpolitik looking eastwards again. Do you think these kind of foreign policy choices or general directions reflect any sort of coherent strategy um, or is this all based on expediency and, and kind of looking either east or west depending on on what works best economically and politically at the time? Well I think there were certainly short-term triggers and short-term maneuvers associated with both positions but basically they did reflect a coherent worldview. I mean for Adenauer uh, the absolute imperative was to end the Schalke politic, the seesaw policy of oscillating between East and West, and to make a very firm commitment to the Western alliance and to democracy. And in consequence, for example, uh, uh, not to take up Stalin's offer in, the, in, in his famous notes in the early 1950s, perhaps to move to some form of united but neutral Germany. So that really wasn't, I think, an opportunistic approach. Obviously, it was heavily criticized, uh, particularly by the SPD, at the time under Kurt Schumacher, uh, but I don't think it was. Um, uh, I don't think it was tactical. It, re it, it reflected a fundamental shift. And likewise, then Ostpolitik wasn't developed overnight. It was pre-thought many years beforehand, and it involved really uh, accepting uh, the loss of the Eastern territories, and thereby, thereby doing that, and moving towards a closer relationship both with the Warsaw Bloc, uh, Warsaw Pact in general. Uh, but in particular, of course, with the German Democratic Republic. So I think these were fundamental choices uh, and not opportunistic ones. I'd like to ask about the um, the end of history, the, the argument famously made by the American political scientist Francis Fukuyama that with the collapse of communism, humanity had sort of arrived at Western-style liberal democracy and the Pax Americana is the, the kind of final evolutionary form of politics – um, it's very often applied to Germany over the past 30 years. For example, um, Thomas Bagger, who was um, the, the foreign policy advisor to President Steinmeier, very famously wrote that um, the end of history had been an American idea, but a, a German reality. Um, I'd like to hear whether you think Bagger was right, and if so, whether this this way of thinking really had such a deadening effect on Germany's strategic culture as is, is often made out. Yes, I think Thomas is absolutely right. And the reason for it is that uh, essentially, after the fall of communism, as, as I mentioned earlier, Germany was, to quote Chancellor Kohl's own words, it was now entirely surrounded by friends. And so the, the, the danger uh, of you know, immediate attack or of destruction completely receded. So there was really no incentive, not even after uh, the 9-11 uh, attacks or other challenges in, in, in the world of, of terrorism or complex emergency. There wasn't really any incentive to think strategically. And uh, annexation of, of Crimea, the invasion of eastern uh, Ukraine, wasn't really taken as an opportunity to revisit that. So yes, I think Germany's strategic thinking, its strategic capacity, even, even much of its military capacity, if you think particularly of the decline of its armoured formations over the past 15 years. I think all of that rusted post-1989-90. Uh, and now there seems to be some sort of rediscovery of strategic thinking. At least there are now different parts of the government that are beginning to kind of try and devise new uh, grand strategy in the wake of uh, the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Um, there seem to be different power centres trying to do that. So you've got the Chancellery, for example, sort of jostling with the Foreign Office, uh, therefore uh, kind of premacy as to who gets to decide the, the direction of foreign policy. I think it's particularly pertinent at the moment. Um, so as we're recording this um, episode, the national security strategy is, is being devised and it may well have been released by the time that this episode comes out. There's also a new China strategy in the making, which may not be out yet when this episode comes out. Um, but is this kind of way of making or devising grand strategy, this German way of doing it, a good way? Well, there's nothing particularly German about having tensions around the formulation and execution of grand strategy. I and mean, you just have to think, for instance, 
of the difficulties you have in the United States between the State Department and the National Security Council. What I think is peculiarly German, or at least unusual for a state of its size and potential importance, is to have a problem around the very idea of having a national security strategy, and indeed of having a national security council. Um, as you know, uh, these are furiously controversial issues within Germany. So it's quite difficult to develop a strategy um, if, if you actually have problems about naming it as such. Um, it, it really is, is a barrier to clear thinking and articulation. We've heard some fairly striking language from Germany's leaders, and in particular in the Social Democratic Party since the Russian invasion of Ukraine last year. Lars Klingbeil, one of the leaders of the of the SPD, said Germany should try and position itself as a Führungsmacht, a kind of leading power in the world. You won't quite hear that 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 sort of language from from Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor, but but he has explicitly uh, promised to make Germany a guarantor of Europe's security. And I wonder what expectations you think that sort of language evokes in Germany's allies, and also what what do you think it actually means in a German context, and whether there could be a gap between what people understand by those terms and what uh, people like Scholz and Klingbeil mean by them? Well, it's certainly rhetorically a new departure. If you think back to the kind of language that you had 10 years ago, where people were talking about Germany as, as a reluctant hegemon. Uh, that's Willie Patterson's term, which, which uh, has been widely used. You have people like Maul talking about Germany as a Friedensmacht, a peace power. So, so for there now to be talk of a Führungsmacht, a leading power, that, that is a major shift uh, in language. I don't actually think in practice the shift has been or will be as great as that. Obviously, there are big changes in terms of, you know, for instance, the supply of weapons to Ukraine. But basically, if Germany were to be a leading power, it could only be that in one of two ways. Uh, The first way would be for Germany to be the kind of pressure of European integration, in other words, to lead a process of the full political unification of Europe, uh, into which it would then be absorbed. That actually is more or less the invitation that Emmanuel Macron extended to Chancellor Merkel uh, several years ago. Not that Germany would lead, but that together France and Germany would deepen the European integration project in a very fundamental way. Um, And that offer essentially was ignored. So I don't think we need hold our breath on Germany being the lead power on integrating Europe. The alternative, the second possibility, is that Germany would itself become the leading power as an individual member state, and that it would lead an intergovernmental coalition. And again, for all the reasons that we've already discussed around uh, the lessons of the Third Reich, around the hesitation, the the unease uh, about even talking about strategy, I don't see that happening. I mean, and both approaches would require substantial change in German policy and politics. And so far, they've done uh, neither. Uh, So I don't expect, ultimately, very much to change. Or if it does change, it will change uh, very, very slowly. Isn't there an argument for that very, very slow change, the reluctance? Kind of Olaf Scholz has sometimes been praised for the idea that he's very hesitant, very reluctant, very slow to move on things. Um, and, and given the volatility of global affairs at the moment, many people have argued that it's not even feasible to have a national strategic vision. So are we going to go back to Angela Merkel's approach of, you know, auf Sicht fahren, as she called it, driving by sight? Are we going to miss that in the future? Are we going back to it? Well, I, I think that uh, for the reasons I've, I've, I've given, that the uh, only way that Europe can really uh, advance in this situation is through the deeper integration. And the problem is that that requires vision. And you can only really have vision when you have the right weather and a clear view on the road. Now, Angela Merkel did actually have that. Uh, for several years before the situation got very complicated with Crimea, the financial crisis, Brexit, and so on. And so, yes, you know, when you have a crisis, you advance from one event to the next and you drive by sight of Sichtfarm, as you've said. 
but you bet you should try to exploit or make use of times when things are a little bit more quiet to make big visionary steps. And unfortunately, Germany has always dodged that opportunity, has not taken up that opportunity. I mean, the first time was in the 1990s after unification of Germany, then again under Chancellor Merkel in the early years of her tenure. And so I think there's a great paradox and a great, I think, missed opportunity that Germany, which sees itself very much as you know, a central force in Europe, is actually on so many occasions the primary obstacle to the deeper integration, which could actually complete the European project and deliver all the things that a German grand strategy would want to deliver. Brendan, many thanks indeed for your time and for these very thoughtful answers. It's been um, a great pleasure having you as a guest on the podcast. Thank you very much. Well, like Metternich after the 1848 revolution in Vienna, we are in danger of outstaying our welcome. And it is probably high time for us to shuffle off to a nice suburban house on the Sussex coast. Don't knock it. You've been listening to The New Germany, a series from the Kerber Stiftung's History and Politics podcast. If you would like to send us your thoughts on Germany's strategic culture or catch his place on the Amtor Fisher scale of German millennials, the easiest thing to do is to tweet at us. Katja's handle is at Hoyer underscore cat. I'm not sure if Oliver even counts as a millennial. <laughs> I mean, he looks as though he's barely graduated from Hogwarts. <laughs> but you can direct your complaints and casual mockery to at Oliver N. Moody. Ouch. I mean, I mean, someone very obviously got sorted into Slytherin. <laughs> and, and on that note, bis dahin from, from Berlin. And cheerio from Sussex.